Uh, good afternoon and welcome to USDTL's webinar on marijuana in hair and fingernails. Our presenter today is uh, Joseph Jones. Joe is the Vice President Laboratory Operations for USDTL with more than 25 years of experience in the forensic toxicology industry and has provided expert testimony in a variety of venues throughout the country. He also appears as an author on over a dozen peer-reviewed scientific articles. Today, Joe will discuss marijuana usage trends and his findings on THCA in hair and fingernails, and then compare and contrast the differences in the two specimens. Please welcome Joe Joe. Thank you for the introduction, Nancy. And uh, I would like to thank everyone for their patience as we uh, begin today. Uh, again, my name is Joseph Jones and I will be presenting um, our presentation here uh, concerning the detection of THCA in head hair, and we will compare that with our findings in fingernail. Before we begin, I would like to point out a conflict of interest. Uh, myself and my colleagues that assisted with the research that we'll present at the end <clears throat> are employees of USDTL which is a privately held company, a commercial laboratory in the business of selling hair testing. The internal funding that was used, we tried really hard not to allow that to influence our study design, our data collection analysis, and choice and uh, decision to publish. Our objective today will be to look at a few marijuana usage trends. We will discuss carboxy THC in hair and nail. How does it get in there and how do we get it out? I'd like to briefly discuss our new method that was launched earlier this year with our new 10 femtogram per milligram limit of detection. I will discuss uh, a research project that we uh, conducted uh, last year and published earlier this year uh, that looked at carboxy THC in hair and nail and how they compared. And I'll end with a few concluding remarks, but more importantly, we will field questions uh, from the participants at the end. Trends of marijuana use. Obviously, marijuana is the most common illicit drug that is used in this country. Uh, obvious uh, second place to alcohol, uh, but alcohol is legal. Uh, so marijuana has the, uh, uh, the title of the most common illicit drug that is in use. In 2010, we had 17.4 million people self-report, so we know it's higher than that, self-report that they used marijuana within the previous month. And most people think of marijuana as being benign and harmless and, and not a big deal. But in 2009, there were over 375 emergency department visits where marijuana usage was a, a factor in the reason that they were in the ER. As everyone knows, we have many states that are now beginning to convert over to either medical use of marijuana um, or decriminalizing the use of marijuana or just flat out making it legal. Uh, the last time I prepared this chart, it was 20 states. And when I was preparing for this webinar, I had to up that number to 23. And um, uh, the most recent addition was Maryland, and you'll notice that I didn't get a chance to color that one in, but that's state number 23 at this point, plus D.C. Uh, before the end of the year, we will probably see Florida and Pennsylvania go. Um, I was reading yesterday on the Internet where those two states have legislation before their uh, state bodies and that some sort of marijuana law will most likely pass in some fashion in those two states. So the trend is obvious, and from the parents, unfortunately, our kids are taking their cue. The Monitoring the Youth Survey has two very uh, disturbing trends, in my opinion. They reported, and again, this is uh, self-report, so we can imagine it's probably a little worse than this, but we are now seeing 12th graders at a rate of 6.5% self-reporting that they're using marijuana on a daily basis. Not a weekend basis, a daily basis. 
6.5%. That's up from 5.1% in 2007. So this trend is definitely heading in the wrong direction. Trend number two are those same, same 12th graders. What is their perception of regular use? You know, is regular use bad? Is regular use good? And what they're finding in the uh, survey is that 44% of the kids don't see it as a bad deal. Uh, you know, regular use, it's not bad for you. It's not bad. That's the lowest that that's been since 1979. So here, our kids are taking the cue from the adults. They're using marijuana more, and they don't think that it's bad to use marijuana. So what we need going forward in our profession is we need as many tools as possible to identify marijuana use uh, that we can use. And when we're looking for marijuana, principally there's two compounds that we're concerned with, THC and THCA. THC is tetrahydrocannabinol, and that's why we call it THC. And THCA is THC acid, or you could call it carboxy-THC. In the cannabis sativa plant, we find up to 85 compounds in that plant that are unique to, the, uh, to that species. They have a similar chemical structure, and as a group, they are called cannabinoids. Of that group of cannabinoids, there is one major psychoactive compound. Uh, this is the one that predominantly is the one that makes you high, and that is THC. In our laboratory, we will refer to that as either native THC or parent THC, so that when we're talking amongst ourselves, we know specifically that we're talking about THC and not the THCF. When you consume THC, and that's either smoking it or ingesting it, say in brownies or a case recently in Colorado, I was just in Denver a few weeks ago, and there was a child got into some candy that was marijuana candy. Um, so it doesn't matter how you absorb it, when it goes through your liver, it is converted into a number of products, but the number one thing that we're looking for here in the lab as a metabolite is the THCA. When you're analyzing urine, just for your frame of reference, we do not look for THCA, we look for T we do not look for THC, we look for THCA. We look for the metabolite. It has a longer detection window that is a little easier to find. As opposed to nineteen eighty seven, when the Drug Free Act was first signed by Ronald Reagan, we now have a number of reasonable specimen types that we can include in our drug testing programs. Now back then, urine was, was pretty much the only game in town. Uh, it was the only thing that was really affordable. Um, and blood, if you're doing a, a coroner's a medical examiner type work, uh, uh, they use blood for their assays. But that's typically outside of the range of uh, in, in the expense category for workplace testing. But nowadays, with the improvement in techniques and instrumentation, we have all of these different specimen types that are available for us. They all have their own advantages and disadvantages. And here is one primary advantage and disadvantage is the detection window. So for oral fluid, you have one to two days. Typically, it's going to be less than one. Whenever we figure out how to do carboxy THC in oral fluid, you will then see that having a detection window of two to three days. But for right now, the only screening mechanisms that we have is for the native THC, unless there's something very recent that I don't know about. In blood, we're looking at one to two days. Uh, for the first six to eight hours, we'll find THC in the blood. And then for the next two to three days, we'll find carboxy THC. And that can give the interpreter the idea where they under the influence if the native THC was present, or if only carboxy T was present, then that means that they did in the past two to three days, but we cannot speak to whether or not they were under the influence. Now for urine, 
marijuana is unusual with the other drugs on a standard panel in that it bioaccumulates. And so we have to break out whether we're discussing a casual user or a chronic user. The, uh, the THC and THCA uh, uh, dissolve into the uh, body fat and fat tissues and, uh, and the proteins throughout the body and slowly leaches out. So for most drugs, you're looking at two to three days like cocaine. But for a casual marijuana user using standard workplace cutoffs, the detection window is about two to five days. For a chronic user, we're looking at 10 to 14 days once they go abstinent. I know we all hear about cases of marijuana can be found in the urine for 30 days. I've actually seen it longer than that. Under extreme situations, you will have, say, an extremely large individual uh, will go abstinent and, uh, and perhaps begin losing a lot of weight. I followed a gentleman at one point uh, years ago uh, who was in solitary confinement uh, in the correction department. Um, but he went from 450 pounds down to about 320 pounds over a six-month period of time, and he was positive all the way. And uh, if you monitored the THC to creatinine ratio, that continued to drop through the whole six months. So uh, the warden was sure that he was not using, and the THC to creatinine ratio confirmed that. Was he sneaking some? I guess it's possible, but we didn't have evidence of that. And also, if you use non-standard workplace cutoffs, like a limit of detection urine, you can possibly see it out much longer than the uh, two to five days or 10 to 14 days. But if we move into the head hair, in the head hair, we're looking at up to uh, three months because the hair uh, test is defined as an inch and a half of head hair. And fingernail testing can go back up to six months or 180 days in in this chart. So we got a wide variety here of detection windows for our, for our uh, choosing. Now how do drugs get in the hair? First and foremost is environmental exposure. If you're in an environment where a drug is being smoked or the environment is contaminated and you're touching the contaminated surfaces, or say if your spouse uh, has a, a drug and you're, you're touching them all the time and or in the case of uh, like a meth lab you're, uh, uh, you're, you're exposed to the manufacturing fumes that drug will physically transfer from the environment to the outside of your hair and once that drug is on your hair it will dissolve, re-dissolve, migrate and re-migrate into the nooks, crannies, and pores. Hair is very porous. We'll get into the hair, the nooks, crannies, and pores, and bind to the proteins. And immediately that drug is available to be harvested and analyzed. Route number two is the sweat and the oil from the scalp. These fluids contain drug and drug metabolite, similar to urine. And as those fluids bathe the hair shaft, they deposit the drug and drug metabolite onto the surface of the hair. And again, that drug will migrate into the hair, into the pores, and will begin to bind to the proteins. And you begin to see that showing up. I've seen some data that shows that at about 12 to 14 hours after a dose. Not in standard workplace cutoffs, but if you jack it down, you can see single doses. Number three is the blood, and this is what most people think about. As the blood travels through the hair root, it deposits the drug and drug metabolite, and as that portion of hair emerges or erupts past the scalp line, then that portion of hair can be harvested and analyzed. Now that process takes about two weeks, and so when you hear people saying it takes two weeks for drug use to show up in hair, this is what they're referring to. But as you can see, these are three extremely different modes of incorporation, and they are superimposed on top of each other. So this is a very complex picture. To boot, once the drug is incorporated into the hair, it begins to slowly leach out due to normal daily hygiene. 
So of all of these variables uh, piled on top of each other, it is practically impossible to backtrack and determine time, dosage, or frequency. What we have at the end of the day is an appropriate detection time window and a simple yay or no. If we need to determine the difference between environmental exposure versus ingestion, if we find the parent drug, THC, that is evidence that we have simple external contamination. If we find the carboxy THC, that is evidence that is suggesting ingestion because it had to go through a liver. Now fingernails. There's not much discussion on fingernails out there, and I'd like to introduce that to you today. So before we begin, a few simple pieces of anatomy concerning the fingernail. We have the nail plate. This is the portion that you can see visible from the top. Under the cuticle, we have the nail matrix. The matrix is where the nail originates. That material forms in here and, start, and, and begins to push out as new material is, is being formed. There is the nail bed, and the nail plate travels across the nail bed, and the nail bed is very rich in capillary blood flow. If you press your fingernail, you'll see it turn white and then snap back to pink. And that's where you're pressing the blood out and then the, the blood pops back in. Now as the nail grows out, it passes over the quick. And then this piece here that extends over the edge is called the distal edge or the free margin. That's the piece that you can clip. Now what is a nail? Fingernails are made of, 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 of keratin. Keratin is a protein. Uh, hoof and horn, if you will. It's all the same stuff. Um, and the difference is a structural difference as opposed to a component difference. The hair is primarily uh, alpha helical formation of, of keratin, whereas the fingernail is primarily beta pleated sheets. And so they stack up, these sheets stack on top of each other, giving the nail the thickness. And as the nail forms and as it travels across the nail bed, the drugs become entrapped in the keratin fibers. Now, when the nail forms, and it grows traveling across the nail bed. As it lengthens, it is also thickening. Material is being added from underneath. And the process from the germinal matrix out to the free edge takes approximately six months. So a clipping on the end here has drug history of this entire trip. So the biomarkers can be found in the nails as early as one to two weeks after use. Now, how can that be? Um, there's plenty of literature in the dermatology journals from years ago where they were using uh, fungicides for nail fungus. And these fungicides were oral administered, they're tablets. And it is very important to know the concentration of the fungicide in the nail because it has to be above a certain concentration before it will efficiently kill the fungus. So they feed the people measured doses of the fungicides, and one of the experiments early on was let's clip the nails and see how soon it shows up. They were expecting it not to show up for six months. But lo and behold, two, uh, two weeks later, they had clippings that had fungicide in it. And so what they attributed that to was fungicide is being incorporated into the nail from the nail bed just prior to it uh, escaping away from the nail bed. And you also have the sweat and the oil from the cuticle around the nail. As that fluid contaminates the nail, it deposits drug and drug metabolite. So the bottom line is, is the fingernail clipping does contain history for that entire six months. Now that time window can change uh, varied on the individuals uh, on the, their health. 
uh, for instance, someone with psoriasis uh, that is uh, having psoriasis flares on the hand, their nails are growing very fast. And uh, that's one example. And then someone that is perhaps in ill health, maybe they have kidney or liver pathology, their nails may not grow as fast as someone that's in a normal state of health. So we have to be aware of that. Now, for years and years, the analysis of marijuana in hair, I think it's safe to say, has been a very, very difficult ordeal. Um, the SAMHSA proposed guidelines back in 1999, this is a long time ago, was suggesting that we needed to have a confirmation cutoff at 0.05 picograms per milligram. And there was one instrument platform that would allow you basically a limit of detection, um, but that was a very unstable platform, not a platform that I found very useful in a modern production facility. And I know that numerous groups have tried numerous strategies to obtain this 0.05 picogram per milligram cutoff. And in our opinion, in order to have a daily cutoff at 0.05 picograms, you need to have a calibrator at 0.05 picograms, and you need to have a control in that batch that is at least 40% below that cutoff. So when we started out on our assay development, we wanted to have a single point calibrator at 0.05 picograms per milligram. That is equivalent to 50 femtograms per milligram. And I'll tell you what a femtogram is later. So we have a LOQ control every day in our batch at 20 femtograms or 0.02 picograms per milligram. Coincidentally, our limit of detection is 10. We desired uh, an upper limit of linearity at 1,000 or uh, 1 picogram. And our controls are at 20, 62 and a half, and 400. That's our daily batch. We wanted the assay to be a very robust assay. We wanted it to at least run 22 consecutive days with no problems. We worked with a gentleman named Fred Fryerherm from Agilent Technologies, and perhaps one of the most brilliant GCMS guys that I've ever worked with in the past 25 years. And coincidentally, he brought into our shop an instrument that is by far the most sensitive instrument that I've ever been able to work with, and that's the Agilent 7000. So um, I'm not advertising for Agilent here, but this is an absolutely marvelous piece of equipment. We were able to obtain a rugged, robust assay that calibrated at 50 femtograms, and our, our, our LOQ control every day is at 20. Limit of detection is 10. Actually, it's a little better than that, a little less than that. And our interday imprecision and bias is all within 15%, which puts us within the guidelines of the FDA uh, uh, recommendations, the European Union, and, um, and, and some other commonly used guidelines for validating an assay. Not only was the assay uh, stable for 22 days, but it's gone three and four months at the time without any issues. So we're extremely pleased with that. And I'd like to share with you, a, well, okay, before that, 1,000 femtograms is one picogram. So 0.05 picograms is 50 femtograms. And also 1,000 picograms is one nanogram, just to kind of give you a frame of reference here. This is our low control and just a batch that was uh, run. This was pulled at random. And we see this every day. Now, whether or not you are a GCMS person or a chromatographer, when you look at this, there's no mistaking here that's a peak. You do not need to have a PhD in chemistry to see that that's a peak. Um, I can assure you prior to this instrument, anything at 0.0165 picograms, you would not see this peak. This is an absolutely incredible piece of chromatography. So any of you lab people out there that are looking at this, um, it does this every day. So it's a marvelous piece of equipment. 
Now, about the study. A couple of years ago, we were funded by the National Institute of Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse to study ETG in hair and fingernail. And we uh, worked with the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. They have a Center for Addiction and Behavioral Health Research. Um, and that was a very successful study, and, and that work has been published. But important for this webinar is that we had a number of de-identified remnants from that study that was left over. And according to ethical protocols, as long as they are de-identified, we can repurpose them for, for the research. Um, out of the remaining, remaining specimens of the research, we had 60 matched pairs of hair and fingernail. Now, we don't have the self-report, we don't know the individuals, we just know that they were between the ages of 21 and 25, they were students at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and that we had matching hair and nails. So limited information that we had on the individuals. But using our new method, we tested all of the hair and all of the fingernails for carboxy THC. And this is what we found. We found that nail 32 specimens out of 60 were positive for carboxy THC. That was a pause rate of 53.3. So if you have kids in college, don't get shocked. These are kids that are signing up to do alcohol research, so we would expect that they may have a little higher positivity rate than, uh, uh, than the average demographic at the university. <clears throat> for the hair, we had 28 out of 60. Now, one shocking piece of information for me um, was early on, I was under the impression that there would be a low rate of compliance with fingernails. I chew my fingernails, and so I project that on everyone else, I guess, and I just assume that you get out in the real world, and uh, you're going to run across a lot of people that do not have fingernail tips. Whenever we did this study, which originally it was 626 uh, uh, folks in the study, the difference between the compliance rate between hair and nail was minimal. It was actually statistically insignificant. There were a few more uh, specimens that were, we had enough specimen for hair. Uh, it was like 93%, but the fingernail was like 91 or 92%. Um, so I, that kind of changed my opinion about nail as a suitable specimen type. Um, as you perhaps try nail, maybe you have similar or differing opinions, and I, I would love to hear what you see in the field. But when we tested the hair, 46.7% were positive. Um, so, so why is that? Why, why are we getting more positives in, hair, uh, in fingernail than we are in hair? And here's why. The main concentration of THC in hair, excuse me, the mean concentration of THCA in nail was much, much higher than what we found in the hair. Converting this, these are femtogram numbers. Uh, so, uh, 1,813 femtograms per milligram. That is 1.813, 1.8 picograms per milligram on average in the nail. Whereas in the hair, that average concentration was 0 0.364. That difference is 1,449 femtograms. And when you do the statistics, it's called a, 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 a paired sample t-test. Are these two differences that we're seeing, are they real, or is there just a sample or so that's causing a crazy outlier? Um, this is showing that the critical value is, is 1.9, which means that this is a a statistically real difference that we saw, and the p-value greater than 0.05, what the heck is that? P-value is, is a measure of the significance. And so what this is saying is that there's less than 5% chance that this is a random observation. And so this is a real difference, and the difference is significant, and it's not random. When we looked at the values together, these are the nail concentrations on this axis, on the y-axis, and these are the concentrations of the matched hair specimen over here. We have a very nice line going through at, with an R value of 0.974. Now, what in the heck is that? That is the Pearson correlation 
factor. And what that is a measure of is the degree of association of these variables. The R value can range from negative 1 to positive 1. If it's negative 1, that means there's a negative association. In other words, when one goes up, the other goes down. If the R value is close to 0, that means there's absolutely no association. It's completely random. And if it's 1.0, that means obviously we have a perfect association. But when you're looking at two different specimen types, an R value greater than 0.6 or 0.7 is considered a strong association. So we have a strong association between the hair and the nail, and that association is significant. The limitations, as I mentioned earlier, was that we did not have access to an accurate self-report. It would have been really nice to go back and look at um, how much dope these kids were smoking and compare the values to that. Um, we did not have verified dose administration, which means you lock people down in a drug ward and you give them joints to smoke and you measure their uh, specimens after a period of time. We did not have the specific demographics. We just know that these are college kids. We don't know the races. We don't know the um, gender. The prevalence is not generalizable. So that 50% positivity rate obviously does not generalize to the uh, general population. And we did not have personal hygiene nor cosmetic treatment information on these specimens. So a number of limita limitations. These results were published in detail in the American Journal of Analytical Chemistry. Uh, this is an open access journal. And so if you search for this title or if you search for my name in Google Scholar, uh, it will come up as one of the top two or three hits. Or if you go to our website, www.usdtl.com, uh, it's there um, for you to pull down. This is open access, so you don't have to pay for it. It's free for you to pull down and share with your clients if you would like. In conclusion, the method that we launched earlier this year is very sensitive and we're extremely pleased with it. And it has totally changed um, marijuana testing for our laboratory. We've also determined that fingernail is not only a suitable alternative specimen, but in my opinion, nail may perhaps be the preferred specimen type. The concentration of carboxy THC in hair and nail are strongly associated. And there's a slightly higher positivity rate in nail. So that's another reason I like cream nail. The concentration of carboxy THC is up to five times higher on average in nail than in, than in hair. And so from a lab uh, technician point of view, higher concentrations are much easier to find the lower concentration. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And uh, would love to entertain any questions that may be out there. So if anybody has a the question that they would like to uh, ask, please type it in the chat box, and, um, and we'll go from there. Hello everyone, I'm sorry I'm having technical difficulties. Um, yes, Joe, one of the questions that was asked is, will this PowerPoint be available online? And I just wanted to let everyone know that it is being recorded and will be available um, and we will send out an email to let you know. Uh, a second question that has come in, um, someone has asked, can we tell how much uh, how much someone has used and or when they used marijuana? 
Um, no. There are so many variables uh, that contribute to the final concentration that we report. It is impossible to backtrack to determine time, dosage, or frequency. At the end of the day, you have an appropriate detection time window and really a simple yes or no. Great. Um, another question that we have is um, if someone bleaches their hair um, and comes in with like white hair instead of their usual color, is, is that okay? Um, any cosmetic treatment should be treated with suspect. Um, if you have someone that has uh, received, a, let's say, a court order or an order for a workplace test to uh, show up for a hair collection, um, if they run to their beauty shop or what have you and get a, a brand new bleach job, that should be marked as a refusal to test, or we should perhaps look at another specimen type such as fingernail or body hair. Uh, bleaching, perming, dyeing, chemical straightening, all of these processes contain varying amounts of oxidizing and or reducing agents, and they definitely affect the test. In some cases, you know, it's not enough to knock it below the cutoff, but it certainly will knock it down below the cutoff in some cases. So personally, if there's obvious cosmetic treatment that is recent, I would not collect the hair specimen. Does that hold true for our fingernails? It seems not to. We have tested samples that um, that have been uh, 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 you know painted with fingernail polish, and uh, we've had people that will uh, wash the fingernail polish off at the time of collection. Um, but frankly, one of the first steps that we have in our procedure uh, takes that fingernail polish off as well. And uh, so it's acetone, it's fingernail polish removal, acetone. And so that is not going to affect um, the hair test. Great. Um, one more question. Um, it says here they've asked, um, I've heard that hair color makes a difference. Is that true? And is that also true for fingernails? That is an interesting point with fingernail. And this is another reason why I and liking fingernail more and more as a drug testing specimen. Not for marijuana, because carboxy THC is an acid. But for the other drugs, let's look at the, at the uh, five panel, methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, and PCP. Those drugs are bases. And bases bind to the melanin and pigments in the hair. And if you look at the result from a blonde to a redhead to a brunette to someone with jet black hair, maybe African American type hair or African type hair, you can have a difference. In, if these people are using the same amount of drug, you can have a 30-fold difference between the lowest result and the highest result. And that's just based on hair color. Now, it turns out for marijuana, uh, the hair color uh, has, uh, uh, has no influence. Uh, there was a nice paper published, gosh, over 10 years ago, where they took the hair of a marijuana user that had salt and pepper hair, and they separated out the gray hair, and they separated out the black hair, and uh, they uh, were pretty much the same concentration in the two different colors. So that was a nice little experiment. And if you email me, I'll be happy to share that paper with you. Fingernail has no pigment, or if it does have pigment, it's very, very uh, low. And so, in my opinion, fingernail normalizes individual hair colors. And so if someone uh, has jet black hair and they're claiming that the test is not fair because, you know, if they were blonde, then they wouldn't be, uh, the probability of being positive would be somewhat lower, um, fingernail would remove that variable. And so fingernails with the absence of the pigments, normalizes the difference between the hair colors. Great. Well, thank you very much, Joe. I think that's all the time we have today. Um, if you do have any questions, there will be a survey that will go out and an email as well. 
and we will be sure to send out an email to let everyone know when this will be available to be reviewed um, online as well. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Have a good day.